am Khadija, and this is What's Up KC, and I am here with Tommy Simmons. Tommy Simmons is a local activist um, and a violence interrupter, and we're here talking about the violence going on in Kansas City, in particular, how high our murder rate is in a region and a half time high, passing the year of 2020, is that correct? Yes. And I am also the co-founder of Justice for Wyandotte. Um, so Tommy, thank you for taking this interview with me. Mm -hmm. um, can we just start out talking about a little bit of your background and then let's go into what happened in April of 2023? Well, I didn't understand my background, but- Well, you don't have to give a whole <laughs> lot. Like, you know, what, what have you been working on in the city? Hmm. Injustice was one of the major things I was working on because I had a problem myself with the system of being wrongly convicted, um, wrongly accused. And so that's basically how it started out too. And then it parlayed over to the numbers of the murder rates of this and rose and risen so high that I had to get involved. I mean, uh, somebody that has some knowledge about the streets, some kind of way, had to step in um, because the people that they got down are just scholars and PhD and people like that, and they have no no uh, resolution of the streets. What what do you see as like the biggest problem with people losing their lives? Like, what is the biggest connection to that right now? Bullets. Bullets. And can you explain to us what that means? Well, most of the people that's dead, they're not dead because they were pistol whip. They they did because bullets killed them. And the reason that is is because we let any and everybody buy bullets. There's nothing wrong with probably buying guns, but who buy the bullets to put them in the guns? And most of what in a survey that we'd have had. We, do, we understand that um, mostly, probably 90% of the people that's dead, they've been shot, probably been shot with an illegal gun. Mm -hmm. And so we my, my question is, is that if we could stop people from buying bullets for these illegal guns, then we might not have the rate where we're at now in 180 or 181 murders. So is, is there a federal law that is already in existence? It's always been a federal law, actually, to be truthful about it. Uh, but, I mean, if you got a law that that having bullets is a felony that you were prison for, and it's the same under the same law that the gun law is under. But, I mean, is there a law? Yes. Do we use it? No. So what makes you need Kansas City unique? to the fact that we don't use it. I know that there are probably, what, seven other states that have they legislation. Have control, yeah. But the uh, majority of them, you know, uh, they don't see what, that's the problem. Uh, I came up through an area where it was hard for youths and kids to buy bullets. You know, you couldn't buy them. And so uh, when we had guns that we had illegally some kind of way, well, it wasn't used to keep them, so we sold them. Well, we couldn't get bullets for them. We just couldn't go into gun stores and buy bullets. And, uh, is there any age at all? Like right now, <clears throat> uh, 15 year old can go in and buy bullets. Who, who checks it? Nobody. Uh, fellas can go in and buy bullets. Um, nine people were shot out on 57th of Prospect. Three was dead, three died, and uh, the other six, uh, they lived. But when it all came down to who did the shooting, it was a guy that was a felon. So if the person wanted to like research and learn more about this federal law, where did you send them? Well, all did you do, and as any any law, you would just go up under um, 18 USC and uh, look at, and yeah, all you do is really put in the gun laws under the federal statute. And the statute come up, you know, with the guns. If you just really want to just find out yourself what the hell. So, do you think um, politics play a lot in the reason why a change can't be made, especially when it comes to gun, gun and bullet laws? Of course, it does. Because uh, 
the uh, gun industry, you know, has powerful, powerful people that, that backs them, you know. And a lot of these gun, uh, uh, the NRA and everything, they back a lot of the politicians, you know. And so when they give money, and that's your cookie right there, when they give the money to these people to uh, rally for them, well, they're taking the money, you know. I think that we could we could cut this whole crime thing in half. All they do is just say, "Stop who buys the bullets." Then they say, "Well, if we do that, then they just get them from somewhere else, you know, somewhere else." But you got you got laws set up where you can you can supervise that too. So, what do you say about people who say um, when you start creating restrictions like this, you put more people in prison? What do you say about that? When you start restricting, I think you put less people in prison. That, that's my that's my say on it, but a lot of people assume that if a person is violating this federal law, that they're automatically going to go to prison. Well, if you don't have if you don't have guns, if, if people don't have bullets for the gun, they ain't gonna be going to rob you. They ain't gonna be pulling up on people with empty guns either. True, true. So let's let's switch gears here a little bit. Um, you know, for me. I do not really like the term black on black crime, nor do I work in that area. However, we're in a crisis now, right? We went from transparency in the police department, looking especially for lemon head to be arrested and charges to be brought against him, which is yet to be done, um, to turning a leaf, so to speak, because this crisis is just sitting in our face. Can you tell us about what initiate your movement and being so aggressive in conflict resolution uh, this year, 2023? Going through the justice system and doing the laws, I found out that there's certain laws for one person and there's certain laws for others. And so, um, give you an example. Um, the guy eliminated speaker who is the FOP president, Brad Lindner. Um, he's the only person that can commit crimes. And they are known crimes. They on the book they crimes. And he has not been arrested. He's still out here running the president of the FOP. And I mean, I mean, just this. And so let me give you a, really a, a good example. The Cameron Lamb case. In the Cameron Lamb case, um, I remember you and I, we went to uh, the appeals court hearing. And in the appeals court hearing, they were sitting there, uh, the three ju the judges up there, and Cameron Lamb's uh, people was, uh, Cameron Lamb's people, uh, lawyers, was explaining to the judges what uh, a debauchator did and how he killed uh, Cameron Lamb. And so he tells the judges that they came in the backyard and they seen him back in the driveway. And uh, he looked at it, had a gun, and he looked like he's going to shoot his partner. And uh, he pulled a gun and, and shot him. So I remember one of the judges said, well, can I ask y'all a question? He said, what's that? If y'all went in his yard, backyard illegally, then y'all would never seen this gun. And they didn't know what to say. They, they stopped right there. So he's okay with it. Now, I got a transcript where Brad Lemon himself, and, and actually the same judge who was in the Barclays case. So we're going to get to that, but I really want you to explain like what it is that made you get into conflict resolution. Well, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm just to stuff okay, here. Okay, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I'm just you, you know? Listen, grasshopper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what I'm, that's what I'm leading up to now. Okay. Is Don't nobody you, laugh at us. Yeah. It's to <laughs> tell you that um, in in a case, my case, Brad Lemon takes his stand under oath, raise his right hand, and swear to this that one night, him and some police officers sneaked up on my property and got the BIN off my car. And then they swear they was stolen. They say it was stolen, but it wasn't stolen because I worked for the, uh, the dealership and I drive the cars home. And they went and got a warrant off of sneaking up on my property, getting the BIN. So that would be the same thing that the judge is saying 
in the Walker's case, if you didn't never sneak up on his property without a warrant and get the VIN number, then you would have never known it was stolen, as you said. But they let Brad Lemon off. You know, they let Brad Lemon off the same identical thing that the Walker did. And the Walker and his wife, Sarah the Walker, she's running around, oh, screaming, hollering, oh, no, this, that, and other. But you should be mad at the judge. And she should be mad at Brad Lemon. And Brad Lemon is the one that got her lawyer, her, her husband, the lawyer, that was behind the whole thing when she was the prosecutor with the dark horses. So what made me get into this justice system is all this illegal stuff I'm but, telling you. But you're you saying now. the justice system, I'm asking you about conflict resolution. Well, that's what conflict resolution is, because if 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 we go sit down with these people that then Transcribing yeah, but, things. But, but let's move to the area of like you showing up to the murder cases. Mm -hmm. I know you've been doing that like way before this year, right? Mm -hmm. But what made you become more aggressive about it this year over the last few years? That's really the question. Like, why are you so aggressive? Even on your today is your birthday, right? Yes. So even on the night of your birthday or the early morning hours of your birthday, you are out re trying to resolve crime and conflict. What is it in you that has stirred you up so much this year that made you get out in the streets so aggressive? Probably probably because and you probably go back before then, but I use this for example. When the nine people got shot, out on uh, 57th and uh, Prospect. Like I say, three dad, and that was shot, that six was shot. While we were standing there, a woman walked up to us and says, I know did I seen it. And I lived there. And uh, I, I, I said to him, somebody, so one of the guys that would have said, hey, uh, I know where the police are looking for. He grabbed the police and said, hey, she knows everything. And they talked to her. And within some hours, which had, we have never seen before in a while, within some hours, the person was arrested. So you you, you immediately saw results, however. Yeah, because if, if the psychology was with the police department and some of the people there, that if they bring some people in the community to these scenes, then people will see them and they will say, hey, I can, I can tell you what happened. So, so basically, you're seeing that incident and, and you're seeing the resolution happen and turn around really quickly. You felt like this was an avenue. Yeah, because people don't want to talk to the police directly. They think, see, they got a thing out here that uh, now uh, uh, we live by code. You don't have, they don't have no codes. You know, uh, you know that's some old stuff that we had coming up and everything. It's certain codes we don't do and this and another, but when you out here shooting innocent people, just like my son was shot, don't bother nobody, don't get into bother, nothing, everything. And these this little wethead idiots uh just killed him for no reason at all. And then we supposed to say, I ain't got nothing to say, you know. No, these guys need to be off the street because they own drugs, and if they don't, if they kill mine, they're gonna kill yours too. So what what do you think is the, the trouble with violence interrupters today? And because we have an excessive murder rate, right? It's over the top. What, what has been the issue with curbing crime in Kansas City? Especially when we have organizations out here that are mandated and funded to do this. What do you think the issue is? I mean, how long have we been having these, these organizations? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, and we get the same thing. You know, they the same organizations out here out here now was here in 2020. And in 2020, we had what 179 murders and, and then we had 178 murders in next year and this and that. We've been hovering around 170 or something say ever since these still organizations existed been here. So I mean, what's I mean. They're not doing anything to me. So, and they get lots of money. True, true. And 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 there's a lot of people who I think do it in the background, like you do, who don't get anything 
but if you did, it could help sustain a lot more and you could see a lot more done. Tell me about um, facilitating um, conflict, facilitating needs around community conflict. Can you tell me about the training that's coming up the 16th and the 17th and how you feel about that? And what, what are your expectations? That started to be had of you, for one, knowing people in the justice system and you telling them what goes on here, which made them say, let us come and see for ourselves. Now we're going to have a great debate, y'all. <laughs> and then they came to see what we was talking about. And then they see when they seen paperwork, not just talk, they seen paperwork to prove what we were saying. Then they come about and say, hey, we got a, we got a, a program that we want to implement. And it's going to be like ground, ground, uh, ground level, and we want y'all to implement it here in Kansas City. And that was the Justice Department. So let's talk about some of the things that tailored the training around. In particular, um, we talked about domestic violence, right? Mm -hmm. And how, in a lot of ways, women in households can stop a lot of the crime that's happening. And that a lot of the violence interruption needs to start with them. Can you give a little brief? I think that a lot of the, the murders and stuff that's going on now, and especially with women, is coming from domestic. And I think it's coming from domestic because women uh, go out and they find these guys, and these guys show them a lot of money in their pockets and everything. And a lot of women need help and everything. So most of the guys probably don't have nowhere to stay. They stand with their mothers and something like that. And so then when they say, okay, well, I got a woman, she got a, a house, and I can give a little money to her. And so then when they move in, she let them move in, and they sit around all day long with no job and everything. And then uh, Bill come back, and like, Bill come here, and they don't get paid, and they can't pay. Then somewhere down the line, the woman say, we got to go. And when she puts him out, and then she might generate somebody else. And then once that guy sees somebody else there, and that's where your conflict comes in. Yeah, we, we talked about that. But there's, a, there, and, and I'm a black woman myself, but there, and, and this is no attack on black women. It's just things that we see in the immediate that could probably change and make a whole lot of difference within our community. But the other thing is that when you have these young sons and they're, you know, proposition to be gangsters and they're walking around your house with guns and how do you curb that? What what can you do to not only keep your safe yourself safe, um, but to also start your 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 children on a the right well, journey. One thing that we hear uh, out in the streets all the time is that a lot of the mothers, you know, they are a lot behind their kids being with it. They watch them come in the house with guns on their sides, and uh, they go buy guns for them or bullets for them. And one of the other greater things is that when the mother has a boyfriend and she gets into it with him, the first thing the mother do is say, I'm calling my son. And she they get their son involved into their domestic relations. Mm -hmm. And that's a great thing that goes on out there now, you know. So when we talk about this, this training is facilitating meetings around community conflict, short name for it is FMAC. Um, it addresses also conflict within authority and principalities. Um, we know that Kansas City is a unique fabric, right? Like there's cliques, there's people that just absolutely don't want to get along um, how do you feel about this training and how it could be utilized to bring some of the leadership together? Because I think our leadership directly dictates to me in some ways why we have such a high time. The one thing about the leadership here, everybody is separated. And I think that if everybody would genuinely 
come together. Sorry about Brian. Um, Pat Clark had a, a, a come together the other night down at the uh, fountain down on uh, Cleveland. And he said that he called out to all the organizations to, to stand down there on what they call a Saturday night. And we get down there, you know, probably just two of us down there with him. And all the rest of it, nobody came, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, people have their, you know, uh, different theories and different uh, attitudes about it. why they won't deal with some people and deal with some people and all that sort of stuff. But, but if we can get that out of the way. So conflict resolution pretty much starts within the inner circles of leadership. Yes. Yes. And so um, our challenge is really to see people through this. Facilitate these meetings where people can that's what come I, together. That's what our goal is, yeah. Um, so beyond that, what do you see productive that can that would happen like maybe the first few months coming out of the training? That is something that we're gonna have to see. I can't be a mind reader to that, but oh, you don't have vision. I don't have that vision no. down here, you know. But uh, till we sit down and do it, and then watch the the, the productivity from it, then uh, probably the next the month after, and I can sit back and we can sit here again, and we can tell what uh it came about it. So. FMAP, facilitating meetings around community conflict, who all can be invited? We're asking neighborhood association leaders. We're asking matriarchs of families. We're asking community leaders, church and faith leaders, uh, educators, conflict resolution uh, preventers within school, uh, those returning back to society. Uh, and we're only asking those who really have a, a deep understanding of conflict resolution, a willingness to take action. Um, if you're not willing to take action, I don't think this is the place for you. If you cannot complete the two-day training, I don't think this is the place for you at this time. It will be on a repeat. But this training is going to coming up January the 16th and 17th from 12 to 4 p.m., right? Yeah. At the Ellington Hall, which is an in independence. All the information will be listed on the flyer. Um, the flyer will be attached to this interview. Um, our goal here, like I said, I, I don't have any expertise in violence prevention other than taking the training myself, being very familiar with, with uh, it, with working with other organizations in the past. However, I am not a a violence interrupter. I don't go knock on doors. I pretty much kind of work behind the scenes in helping to facilitate uh, these events and making sure that we all get trained. So if you're very interested, you can email me at KhadijaHardaway at Yahoo.com. And again, that information is on the flyer. Share the flyer with as many people as you can. But what I want to say to, to my community is that um, we do a lot of social um, gathering in Kansas City, a lot of entertaining one another. But what I hardly ever see is us coming together or us warning the next person about the dangers in this violence that we're going through. And so I am encouraging families to have a dialogue about what is happening in our community. And that is the start. Communication is the key to everything. This is brought to you by Kansas City Business Association, working to improve our community.